Ladies and gentlemen, good morning. I want to welcome all of you here in person and attending the conference online to this World Economic Forum session of the Summer Davos here in Tianjin. We're talking about China-Africa relations, a mutually transformative relationship today. And uh, first of all, I really want to take this opportunity and welcome all of you um, to China, or shall I say back to China, after a multiple year absence. Uh, has been a difficult few years, I know that. But um, welcome back. I hope you have had a good journey so far. And welcome to this session. China and Africa relations is certainly one that is both uh, marked with potential and uh, controversies from time to time. Uh, oftentimes when people talk about China-Africa relations, we tend to look at it from a bird's eye view. Um, but down to the specifics, uh, the nitty gritty of the relationship, there's so many components of it. It's multifaceted. Um, so today I think is a very important conversation and I'm really honored to have, uh, I would say, a cutting edge uh, group of panelists joining us today to delve into the specifics of this evolving landscape of China-Africa interaction. Um, we hope to walk away today with uh, many uh, nuanced understanding of this relationship. Without further ado, let me introduce the panelists for today. Uh, we have sitting next to me uh, the Honorable Felix Tapiwa Mhona. He's the Minister of Transport and Infrastructure Development of Zimbabwe. Welcome, sir. Great to see you. And also we have Madame Nokululeko Nuyembezi, the chairperson of Standard Bank Group of South Africa. That is the largest bank anywhere in Africa. We have Richard Ingvarsen, Chief Executive Officer from Scan Global Logistics Asia. Um, last but certainly not least, um, Wang Yiwei is the professor from Renmin University from People's Republic of China who writes extensively about China Africa relations, among other things. So let me start with you, Minister, if you don't mind. Uh, China-Africa relations, of course, is a huge topic, um, but China-Zimbabwe relations in particular uh, is one that is marked by a friendship, uh, long-term friendship. Uh, there is a continuity of uh, government in your country, uh, so it is in China. Uh, it's a very strong partnership. Uh, but the same might not be said or cannot be said about China's interaction with some other countries in, in Africa. Um, we've heard about you know, the controversies um, uh, regarding the infrastructure project, whether or not the nature of Chinese investment in Africa is extractive. Uh, some call it neocolonialist. But China-Zimbabwe relationship is certainly bothering um, something that is most of the times uh, friendly and mutually beneficial. So how do you really look at China-Africa interactions in general and China-Zimbabwe friendship in particular. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Wang, and uh, to the esteemed delegates. I'm actually privileged to be here and uh, feel humbled. And to answer your question, uh, Brother Wang, it is true. And uh, what I want to uh, portray here is the negative perspective that we have when it comes to uh, China-Africa relations, where people have uh, the tag to say maybe what comes to African countries is inferior. But I want to also ride on the point that you've highlighted, the relations that we have, that are strong relations based on our founding fathers. And as we speak, uh, the current leadership uh, is excellent comrade uh, Emerson Damzom Nangagwa and comrade Xi Jinping, which is of uh, sound foundation. And I'm happy to say, uh, yes, in Africa, you have seen that we are endowed with the resources. And this is something that we must break about is Africa. And what we've been hearing for years is the value addition of our resources, where not necessarily from China and, and Zim and Africa in general, but we are saying we also need to tap into our resources, one, and also be in a position to value it. That's why we we'll see and in a number of fora, people talking about neocolonialism in the sense that resources are actually um, going one direction from Africa to Asia or even uh, beyond. But what is of paramount importance, uh, Brother Wang, is that, yes, the relations that we have, that have been cemented, and we need to ride on that relationship. And uh, maybe that, uh, to, to take it closer home, when you talk of Zimbabwe, we, we, we really enjoy cordial relations with China. And as we speak, and um, within the next two weeks, we'll be commissioning one of the largest airports in Africa the Robert Gabriel Mugabe International Airport, 
which is a result of this relationship that we are talking about. So it is very important to then say, and it is historic in the sense that it was completed within two years, which is something that is of paramount importance. And not only that, if you look at the energy sector, everyone is crying. We are talking about close to 800 million without uh, uh, energy globally. But we are saying uh, we are mitigating the issues to do with energy shortages in Zimbabwe, where recently again we've commissioned the Wange 7 and 8 as a result of this relationship that we're having with China. And above all, we've got one of the best parliaments that has been constructed again by this kind of relationship that we're talking about. So for us, we break as a country, but however you raise the issues of controversies, and I'm sure this can be found in other jurisdictions where people are saying in terms of continuity, uh, whether it's change of governments, but for us it was quite stable. You know, for the past 40 years we were having one president, and now we've got a brilliant president, Comrade Demas of Damzom Nangago. So there is continuity. And even it dates back to the liberation struggle, where we're also having uh, solace and comfort and training from China. So precisely, I can say we are very happy, and uh, it could be something that we must preach to the world that, yes, let us work. And this same f philosophy of working hard is what we are also embracing as a country. So globally, I can say to the African countries, yes, what we only need to do is to make sure that we don't continue just exporting our raw materials, whether they are raw minerals, but we also need to uh, gravitate uh, towards the further step of uh, value adding our, our resources. Thank you. Yeah, uh, recently we were talking to the president of DR Congo, um, the Honorable Mr. Jisekedi. Uh, there was this uh, you know, infrastructure for, for mining deal that was signed in the 1990s that uh, you know, got delayed a couple of times. Um, you know, uh, and then the, the deal is being renegotiated. Uh, how do you th see situations such as that? Do you think those are uh, mostly issues deriving from the, the market, the Chinese businesses, uh, when they have deals with, with the local governments? Or, or do you think uh, the policymakers um, should be responsible, responsible for that? And also you talk about the fact that you're, turning, you're trying to turn resource curse into resource blessing. Mm -hmm. And how do you see China you know, coming into play with that regard? Thank you very much, uh, Brother Wang. It is uh, true that, yes, like I indicated earlier on, that in other jurisdictions you might find such controversies. And you alluded to earlier on that it could be due to change of government. And if you look at the DRC that you've just cited, my, my namesake, H.C. Uh, e. Felix Chisakedi, uh, you find that uh, the change of government, like you indicated, could be a contributing factor to that effect. But also, above all, the issues to do with transparency and accountability, which has to be enshrined in our Supreme Constitution, is of paramount importance. Whether they are deals, they must be brought before Parliament for scrutiny. And you find that see, is, uh, African countries is something that we just need to ride on. And also to take it closer home uh, in our Supreme Constitution, we also value the issues of transparency and accountability. But where it is vague, you would have such uh, people alluding to issues to do with controversies. So it is uh, a humble plea again to, to us as a continent to say when we partake into such deals, we also need to be transparent. Yeah, there are so many issues I want to ask your opinions on. But for the moment, um, Madam uh, Nguyen Benzi, uh, how do you look at this evolving partnership between China and Africa um, from the perspective of being uh, the, 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 large, the, the owner of the largest bank in, in South Africa? Well, it's actually somewhat more, from my perspective, at least more um, nuanced uh, than, than my colleague here from, from Zimbabwe. Um, Sunda Bank Group has had a relationship with ICBC dating back over 20 years now. In fact, I would um, hazard the guess that that is still the single largest outward investment in the African continent uh, by a Chinese corporate. So, um, so it's a long-lasting relationship. It's gone through lots of changes of leadership. It certainly hasn't been a consistency. But it was born out of very clear mutual benefits. So each side was clear what it is that um, the interests that were being served by this relationship. And so it's predicated on solid ground. Together with ICBC, we have collaborated over the years in supporting trade between China and, and African countries, quite a few African countries, what we 
referred to as the China-Africa Trade Corridor. And we are today the leading financier and supporter of all types of financial services that are required uh, to make that thrive and prosper. So that's been a really, really good uh, uh, collaboration that's lasted years. And I believe that with the free trade agreement, that's going to become even more important because all of the kinds of infrastructural developments and, and, um, and other development in Africa will require uh, massive support from, from big balance sheets. So that is the good part. But you did ask some searching questions in your opening remarks that it certainly hasn't been uniformly good. Um, part of the difficulty that Chinese companies have experienced, for example, in coming into South Africa, has been, the, in the early days at least, the notion of inferior quality. South Africa has always had very strong relationships with Europe in the first instance, and the US <coughs> secondarily. And so you get everybody coming to bid uh, for business. And, uh, and there has been, to be fair, not so today. So it has evolved. So the issue of inferior quality definitely has bedeviled the relationship between South Africa and China uh, to just single out one, one country. Uh, but I think there was a time on the continent there started to be noises, particularly from the AU, of a transactional client contracting type uh, relationship, which is not what was sought. Because in thinking about how Africa was to develop and grow, what the continent was seeking was a partner. Um, and so, so there was a, if, if you look at the pattern of trade, that is a huge part that actually is contracts. And those contracts are not free. So you fast forward and you look at some of the debt weaknesses around the African continent. Some have defaulted, like Zambia, Ghana, um, that you're overloading weak governments with excessive debt with not such cheap debt, although I have to say, I mean, Chinese debt has been largely concessional in nature. So there's definitely been issues of uh, a sensitive nature that have not made this relationship all plain sailing, which would be unusual. You know, you've got, a, you've got big, big uh, positive factors to play for, but they're also quite negative ones. By and large, I would say on balance, the view today uh, of the average African, and I'll, I'll quote a survey that has just been released, the average view uh, on the street is quite positive. Uh, it's the first time that I have seen a survey of that size. It was a multiple thousand in the sample where the view for most Africans is, of China is positive. In fact, more positive than the US. So something is changing, and in my mind, it's because the, this relationship is evolving and touching, having multiple touch points that people can see for themselves are positive net-net uh, for the country, more so for some countries than others. And then just finally on, on, on this, um, just as Africa is changing, looking for different things in its future, putting together this free, uh, the continental free trade area to try and um, accelerate growth, we also recognize that China itself is changing. So whilst in the past it was fine to go get cobalt out of DRC, throw it in the sea, send it to China for processing, there's now this um, bigger push for beneficiation on the one side. There's also an appreciation of the fact that structurally China is changing to a more consumer-led economy rather than just an investment-led. So we were essentially uh, exporting commodities into the real estate development because that's where the, you know, this, it was making the steel, it was making all of the construction materials. As China becomes a far more consumer-facing economy, the role of Africa in a two-way stream becomes a little bit more difficult to define. Hence, it's far more, for, far more important for African countries today to talk much more intensively with Chinese manufacturers to come and manufacture in Africa and therefore attract that particular cohort 
because of the free trade area creating much larger markets instead of 54 fragmented disparate markets where you have to learn totally different regulatory for, uh, frameworks for these, you now hopefully have a somewhat more harmonized uh, area where an African, an African country, in one country you can have a Chinese manufacturer that has access to uh, 2 billion plus population in the next 20 to 30 years. So I see the relationship between China and Africa changing quite significantly over the next 10 to 15 years from what we had all become accustomed to, which was extract raw materials, build airports, etc., into something somewhat more sophisticated and somewhat more intertwined than it is today. Mm -hmm. uh, then very quickly, um, regarding lending from China to Africa, uh, there's so much talk and reports about debt burden, uh, debt burden um, whether intentional or as a result of the investments. Uh, earlier, I only touched upon the, the, the lending rates of Chinese banks towards African infrastructure projects that might be uh, higher than some national lendings from other countries. But uh, as far as we understood, it's still lower than uh, much of the uh, commercial banks and some of the, uh, the, the, the rates are concessionary, as you have mentioned. So do you see that the debt burden um, you know, resulting from the BRI or Chinese lending, um, first of all, do you think it's intentional? And if not, um, what do you see as a uh, potential solutions to them? Well, look, th there's no question that the debt burden has not been helped by all of or, these. Or whether or not there's a geopolitical flavor to the Chinese to, investments, um, strings attached, for example. Those are the, the, the common rhetorics. Well, I think when what is true is that African governments need to be crystal clear about their own development needs, right? So if the government of Zambia did not need a bridge or an airport, then there was no reason for them to agree to build the bridge or the airport. The fact that a Chinese manufacturer needed that to export their goods is a different story. So if we get to a place where we say, oh, now we've got all this infrastructure, we don't really need it for ourselves, we need it for the Chinese to get goods out, oh, well, sorry for you, you ought to have been much, much clearer right from the start. So there is a noise in the air conditioning. I don't think it's loud. I think that the infrastructure that's been built has by and large been needed by countries, whether countries like Zimbabwe did two airports is debatable, but, but essentially I think by and large that has been needed. Um, secondly, it's true that where it is an SOE that is lending to the African country, um, that has typically been concessional funding. Where it has been a commercial bank, I don't believe that that is uniformly true, but that is true for the West as well. Western banks, commercial banks also lend at commercial rates, no, no difference. So that's not, I think, where the divergence happens. The divergence happens when there's trouble. So there is a well-established resolution framework um, that was established in the Paris Agreement many, many years ago by the multilateral institutions, when a country defaults, here's how we deal with, um, with debt restructurings. China doesn't go with that. China has not signed up to that. So you've seen this play out in Zambia, where the one side that is governed by the multilateral frameworks is going in one direction, the Chinese uh, lenders going in another direction, and never the two could, could meet for three years, and, 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 and Zambia has been in no man's land for three years. This is frightening to people. So anybody who today in Africa carries, or sovereign that carries um, a bilateral arrangement with China on the one side and a multilateral one with IMF, et cetera, must be thinking if this happened to us, we in Stuck, right? So, so it is, I think Africa caught in the middle here is neither China's fault, no, the other one's fault, it just is, it, it again drives home this issue of there are areas in the world where this collaboration, cooperation is so far more important, but Africa doesn't have the power to change that, China does, and China chose not to use their power to help Zambia out for three years, right? So, 
because I mean the multilaterals were never going to move. Um, so I don't think it has played out in Ghana so much because Ghana didn't have the same dynamic. So that is more, I think, where I was trying to get to with, with all the part of the debt, uh, not that China was overburdening Africa necessarily. All right, thank you for those clarifications. Uh, Ricard, let me turn to you. Uh, so you're in logistics business. Um, you have a lot of uh, in-person experiences on the ground regarding how the Chinese uh, initiatives are transforming uh, the local markets. Uh, can you talk to us a little bit about um, China-Africa relations from your own perspective, from your business perspective? OK, thanks, uh, Wang. And, and good morning to everyone. I'm a bit overwhelmed being here with these experts, but I'm already very intrigued of, of listening and learning from you guys. So this is seen from my uh, humble side and, uh, and, and from, from what we do in our company. Uh, what I can say, we are very proud uh, to, to, to be uh, the biggest humanitarian um, transportation um, supplier uh, for UNICEF. And, World Health Program, uh, World Health Organization, World Food uh, Program, and the peacekeeping forces. And, and as, as the lady said uh, yeah, in, in, the, in the sitting earlier, Africa is not one country. It's 54, and it's massively uh, uh, different, uh, with different needs and, and different outlooks uh, as it is. But it's a growing area, and for us, it's super important that the trade between China and, and the African net continent uh, develop and, and prosper, uh, not only for imports of you know, vaccines and, and, and equipment for manufacturing, but also for exports, and not the traditional, uh, only the raw materials, but um, you know, allowing and helping uh, customers that, that we care uh, cargo for to deliver it safely uh, to landlocked uh, areas or where maybe the airports are not fully uh, delivered in a safe manner without you know, um, being tempered to uh, uh, pay someone off, because that's, we have to uh, say, there are areas in, 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 in Africa, there are areas in, in, in Europe as well, uh, as well in South America that are, um, uh, you know, have, a, have a bit of an issue of, of, uh, with uh, corruption and so So you, you just have to be mindful and, and, and uh, be professional in, in the approaches. Uh, but I, I'm, I'm, I'm very thrilled that I have no political issues of, of uh, what people may be talking about. I, I just see this as a natural course of development. And it, it will not only help uh, the African continent, but it would help the entire world you know, to increase and, and erase poverty and, and give uh, good education and, and opportunities to uh, you know, the, the youngest uh, and, and fastest growing uh, continent of the world. So um, I'm, uh, again, very humbled to be here and, and, and see it from our perspective. But I'm, um, yeah, we are, since uh, a few years, uh, operating ourselves in, uh, in seven, eight countries. Uh, latest edition was Kenya. And we will be in more countries uh, coming up. Uh, and again, I'm, 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 I'm talking from, uh, from the transport industries uh, here. Uh, aside, and, and many, many of our friendly competitors has left uh, due to, to certain issues, uh, while others are going in with open eyes, uh, seeing it from an entrepreneurial side as well. Uh, earlier on, we talked about uh, some of the challenges over there, um, for example, cyber crimes that you, you mentioned. Um, but of course, Africa, like you said, is uh, uh, the, the youngest continent in yeah. the world with a huge potential. Uh, with this dynamic youth population uh, and uh, progressive policies in many parts of Africa. How do you make sense of these competing dynamics? Yeah, good question. I mean, uh, over the days here, which has been fantastic, you know, there has been a lot of talks of AI and, and data change, exchange. Uh, I don't think it's only related to the countries. It's related to small companies being attacked by cybercrime. So we need to you know, help educatedly uh, on, on how to deal with these matters because it, it, if it strikes one uh, company or one country, it will, you know, impact so many. So the, once there's exchange of data and you have a lot of data, there are temptations, of course, so, and, and, and educate people having the resources to, 
you know, fight uh, the, the cyber crime with uh, cyber security. I think that's, that's vital for everyone. Uh, it's, it's too easy to click on something and, and, uh, and it, it, you know, that can have a massive uh, impact for, for, for the organizations and, and countries as such. Yeah, exactly. Um, let me turn to you, Professor Wang. You wrote extensively about China Africa. I lost count how many articles you sent me over WeChat about China Africa issues. <laughs> <laughs> over, all over Africa. Over the year. You've been to Africa, what, uh, to over a dozen countries now? Um, I haven't been to Africa. Uh, my apologies. Would love to, hopefully, later this year for BRICS. Um, so, so talk to us about uh, how do you see as, the, of course, the complementarities between China and Africa? As China is aging, of course, and Africa being the youngest continent, and also the Chinese economy is transforming uh, into, uh, hopefully, a consumer uh, consumption-led and uh, consumption-driven economy, uh, whereas Africa is also trying to move up, move up the value chain. Um, how, how do you see these, uh, these occurrences? Thank you. Uh, firstly, I'm uh, actually uh, not just focused on Africa. I, I'm more focused on Europe. <laughs> I'm the Yomini Chair Professor of the European Union. But why I focus on Europe in recent decades because of the Belt Road Initiative, uh, and also I think I'm an international relations scholar, you need to focus on developing countries, developing continent, uh, the most uh, dynamic and uh, hope uh, that by uh, 2030, 40%, 42% of their, uh, their youth will be Africans. So this is hope, this is the future. This is not uh, the uh, new continent. Actually, the human beings originated in uh, Lucy, mm -hmm. you know, <laughs> years ago, it's from I've heard Estopia, that theory, yeah. So, so that's really, okay, also, we are Chinese, we are humble. We learn a lot from Europe, you know, how to, how to deal, with, uh, how to uh, work uh, better, you know, in Africa. The comparative advantage of China, actually, compared to Europe, I think three things. First, uh, first uh, visit, trip of the foreign minister of China every year in the past uh, 17 years is to Africa. China always say I'm, uh, we are the developing country, so the people uh, veto power in the United Nations Security Council. This is not for China. This is for developing countries. And Africa is the, uh, all of the African 55, uh, they are Afri uh, developing countries. So that's, uh, I think, political uh, foundation is very strong. So we view our relation with Africa as South-South, so it's brotherhood. This is a uh, community of shared futures, naturally. Second, I think uh, China uh, modernization is uh, very attractive to the uh, Africans because we are very fresh of the modernization, urbanization, agriculture, uh, all of this. Maybe Europeans, the Americans, is, uh, maybe 100 years ago, is not adapt to the local condition of uh, Africa. So China actually is the transform the, the high standard of the West to, uh, to match the African's condition. Because we know how to do this. So 40, 40 years ago, China's per capita GDP is only one third of the South Sahara for African countries, even less. But now, you know, China is very advanced. So it's very attractive to Africa. So uh, we can share some experience, uh, but we have never saw our model. I think that's very important. Thirdly, as you mentioned, it's very complementary. Before, we are very complementary with the West, uh, their advanced economy. But now, the th views of China are the strategic competitor. But we, we views of Africa is a hope. We, we, we I think, uh, your aging society, aging society, and also uh, industrialization, digitalization, uh, Africa is young dynamic. We have many uh, complementary cooperation projects in Africa. Millions of Chinese live there. Uh, maybe can you share with us some of your experiences of visiting the African uh, countries and how you see that the Chinese uh, cooperation are, are perhaps transforming the, the employment, uh, the markets, and also the livelihoods there? Well, many love stories. Uh, one time when I visit uh, Kenya, there's a railway, you know, the Mombasa to uh, Nairobi. I, I, I saw there's a slogan is, uh, let the zebra can cross the tomb without uh, need to koto. So that's a uh, uh, protected environment. Let, let the zebra <laughs> cross the channel without koto. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So. Uh, not just human rights, animal rights are also very important. <laughs> That's the type of so we, we learned how to do that. We, we have the better ex uh, experience in other places, so uh, we are trying to learn very fast. That's the first story. Second story to South Africa. Uh, we, when I visit uh, Mandela's uh, hometown, uh, this is very attractive to me. It's called Ubuntu. It says, I am because we are. Okay, that's the community of shared future. Huh? You can, you know, in English, I always capital. But I is small in Chinese culture. I can be I only through you. 
Uh, we can be other, we us, not I. So I think I learned a lot from Africans' uh, spirit and the culture. And another story is uh, in Kenya. Uh, again, Kenya is uh, uh, without the plastic. It's good, even more uh, tightening than Germany and Europe. But the problem is they, they don't have this, and then we, we, if you eat the restaurants, some food and remain, and then you cannot uh, back and the take home, <laughs> and then cause some problems, even uh, uh, some, some virus. So China's approach is to. <laughs> so China's approach is say yes, high standard, but you need to transfer the high standard to match the local condition. So China is the bridge to connect the West and Africa. Can I just add something to that? I think yeah. it's very important to understand uh, the particular attraction of African countries uh, towards China. It is the fact that in our lifetime we have seen a country lift that many people out of poverty. That, that we had not seen because clearly Europe took centuries to, to get to the same point. This is an experiment that has never been done in history. Um, the only thing is, as more and more African governments sent many delegations to China to study the model, to see how it could be replicated, we simply couldn't replicate it because there were just certain dynamics of Chinese society, how the government is made up, how the people's culture is, that did not match into Africa. So what you're saying about you could take it to an African um, level is true, but up to a point. I think the Africans have to do the rest because there are very, very big cultural differences that make what happened in China quite difficult to replicate in other places. No, so I think very important because I'm the teacher. You know, I just came back from Nisan, uh, the hometown of Confucius. Confucius is actually very famously. Three people work there. One be my teacher. So not that three people work there. I be their teacher. No, we we asked the uh, Africans and other driving country can share some experience of China, but we never sell our model to them. You need to be your own, uh, your own, uh, your 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 own uh, style. We some experience to share, but not copy. So the Europeans made mistakes. You always sell your model, normative power, by example, all this is uh, okay. Uh, high let, high let, me, uh, let me interrupt there. It's a very blunt <laughs> statement. Uh, <laughs> Good. No, you're Ricard, Ricard, I know you're not a politician, you're not a diplomat, uh, you're not even a policymaker, but hey, you're representing Europe here <laughs> by looking around. <laughs> your uh, your, your response. Sweden, not colonized. Okay. Also true. Your response. <laughs> No, I, I mean, a response to exactly uh, what, what question? Uh, what he said about the Europeans in, imposing their models on others, whereas yeah, China doesn't I, I, necessarily. Yeah, that's sadly. I mean, again, I'm, I'm not a politician, but uh, people have perception. They have perception of uh, uh, Mali. They have perception about China. They have perception about everything. Uh, uh, but, but it's all, I mean, if, you, if you're adult and, and, and you say it, uh, it's our goddamn responsibility to help uh, people in, 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 in you know, situations where they need to emerge and, and, and develop. So um, whether that is um, education or whether that is in, you know, to help uh, from deliver logistic solutions from, from hand to mouth, um, we all need to fight that. We, and, and in Europe, they are, I mean, they are too wealthy in, in, in some way, but they also become a bit too lazy. I mean, um, certain things they, they, they push forward and, and, and uh, you know, for example, on the environmental, uh, um, you know, to, to, to ship down to Africa and maybe uh, for doing some recycling to improve their own profile. That's not right. You need to deal with those issues back in Europe as well. Uh, so not, not to explore. Uh, uh, no, not to exploit, but to explore, uh, the, you know, the the African continent and, and the people there. So for me, I'm, you know, it's, I'm a good human, human uh, and I have that approach to things. I uh, see enough. it openly. Fair enough. I think uh, we're, we're um, it's a good representation today. Uh, we have representatives from China, Europe, and the African continent, um, which is a good mix. Um, Minister uh, Mahona, let me turn to you again. I mean, this is also an, a fantastic opportunity, I think, through the World Economic Forum to really educate us, the Chinese, and people from the rest of the world more about Africa. Because these days you don't hear as much about Africa uh, from mainstream international media, who might focus on um, international geopolitical hotspots, or the war, or scandals of their domestic <laughs> politics, 
Um, but, but, but really, what is Africa is, uh, is, a, is a myth. Um, so can you maybe talk about things that you think is important to your country? For example, urbanization. I know more people are moving into the cities at an unprecedented rate in Africa. The youth population and digitalization. What do you think are the important trends for the world to know about your country and the continent? Uh, thank you so much, uh, Brother Wang. And just to start by inviting you to Africa, and in particular to Zimbabwe. I'd love to take uh, my crew. My, my uh, photographer is there, my, <laughs> my producer uh, there. Yes, <laughs> and to say, you, you are very right. It's about a myth of Africa. But um, in the first place, we need to blame ourselves as Africa. He heard from my sister that we are talking about 54, 55 countries. And we are fragmented in terms of the approach. Just to cite a good example, if you want to fly to uh, Senegal, my sister's country, seated there, you need to go out of Africa to go back to Africa. So the connectivity now issues. So at times it comes to, to back to us as a continent, so that uh, the moment we are fragmented, uh, then we are taken advantage of. And uh, I'm happy to say such kind of a fora who then um, uh, mitigate such or allay such fears that what sort of a continent is this? But I want to say, yes, Africa is a beautiful continent. And uh, we also want to thank the, the resources that I alluded to earlier on that we have got everything in Africa. So at the end of the day, it's also very important to say, how then do we move a step forward in trying to mitigate and also address such fears and to say to the outside world, come to Africa. But you find, I can just cite a good example. There is cricket happening as we speak in Zimbabwe for world qualifiers, but it's not being broadcast. So it shows, like you, you alluded the, the to, what? A world qualifiers for cricket. Okay. cricket. Yes, there are about 10 countries there, and also America is, is included. I'm just citing a good example. But you find that it's not in the public domain. So it, at times, it's the packaging of what is happening in Africa. That is not within the purview of, of the, the generality. So at the end of the day, we are saying, these are some of the issues that we need also to, to make sure we address. And we are saying is the digital um, era that we are in. And you talked about the uh, demographics in terms of the youth. We is, uh, like in Zimbabwe, we are talking about 75, um, uh, 65 to 70 percent being the youth. So we've got the energy to drive and you find that the other myth, you'll be talking of ministers, they are maybe old of advanced age, but I'm seated here, and which is also a myth. If you then talk of um, ministers coming from Africa, but we are very happy to, to have such a fora where we can articulate issues, where we can say to the, to the global world, come to Africa and demystify what you hear. And a number of people, when they visit African countries, they are mesmerized. Whatever they see there, against what they hear is totally different. So I think it also calls for a holistic approach as a continent so that we need to unite and also address some of the concerns uh, from a holistic perspective. Can you name two or three things that you think people from the outside world might be mesmerized by, as you said, uh, by Zimbabwe? The endowments, we are talking of close to 70 minerals that we can exploit just for Zimbabwe. And you are talking of the lithium, the, the one that is very topical here the electric vehicles that we're talking about. And yesterday we managed to visit one of the factories here where they are producing about 460 to 65 per day units. But they need the resources. And you find that we are in the top six within the world when it comes to the production of uh, lithium. But we are saying lithium is moving as raw as it is without value adding it, which is something that if you value add per ton, you can get close to 700,000 per ton. But if you just export it as raw, you're getting $600 per ton, is an example. So you see that these are such kind of issues that we need to address to say yes, in terms of uh, infrastructure, the opportunities, we have the rail, we have the water bodies, and which are very magnificent. And if you talk of Zimbabwe, we break off close to 10,000 water bodies. So imagine such kind of uh, investment that you can then tap into. The maritime issues, so we are saying even the skies, open skies policy, and we ride on a policy of any given nation. And in particular in Zimbabwe, we say we are a friend to all and an enemy to none. But you find in other jurisdictions we are impeded, where we have got uh, illegal sanctions imposed on us. So at times we then tend to side and move together with those who would uh, be on our side. Thank all you. All right. Sure, sure. Um, thanks for these clarifications. Um, Madam Chairperson, let me turn to you. China had this 
huge, massive infrastructure program called the BRI, Belt and Road Initiative. And African, uh, Africa is uh, aggressively pursuing this free trade area initiative. Uh, how do you see the synergy between the two going forward? Yeah. Um, so clearly, if you remember what I said a little bit earlier about um, the next growth vector in the continent being the combination of consumer markets. So today, if you want to tap into the consumer space, you're talking about going to 54, 55 different markets. How many countries are there? I thought it was 54. Was it 55? I heard you say 55. I'm staying with my 54. Um, so 55. Yes. Okay. So 55 countries. So, so what the free trade area will do then is to introduce tariff-free movement of goods between these 55 countries. So whilst we were looking for technology and manufacturing that was far more commodities based in the recent past, what this opens up is um, consumer facing products. Now you marry that with this population, this so-called demographic dividend on, in Africa, where in the next 10, 20 years, you're going to be seeing an Africa that is far more educated, that is far more urbanized, that is far more digitally savvy, just by from you know, this youth factor uh, than before. You then take number three, the fact that actually it's a very useful lens to think of African countries as not just put this country lens aside and think about cities, that your, your fastest growing, top, top 10 fastest growing cities in the next 10, 20 years are going to be in Africa. You then overlay that with Belt and Road, which presumably would have already put in place the infrastructure for those consumer markets to be reachable by whoever comes into it. So, so I think that it's not just two factors coming together, but a multiplicity of factors that make it, in my mind, a compelling proposition for, Africa, for Chinese manufacturers to seriously consider Africa as an expansion node for some of the things that they have done and done so successfully here. So if Europe and the US are anything to go by, as countries get richer and people demand higher wages, and we've seen it here, right? People start to demand higher wages, and therefore what used to be a competitive uh, um, factor for China, which was a dirt cheap labor rate, starts to disappear out of the horizon. Where are you going to go? All right, you're going to Vietnam, you're going to Philippines, but Africa is a real, realistic prospect for some of the low value addition manufacturing initially. Now, where do you see this today? You see it in Ethiopia. Mm -hmm. You see a lot more of Chinese manufacturers moving to Ethiopia doing simple things initially, but over time, even that will increase. So, so I think that, uh, you know, it's just one was the underpinning was the extraction of minerals. The next one was Belt and Road in the infrastructure development. The next one becomes this uh, free trade area so that you get more integration. On top of that, you overlay the transfer of technology and the low skill manufacturing. And over time, more and more uh, sophisticated manufacturing. So it's a story that has got quite long legs and we'll be here in 20, 30 years time looking back saying actually uh, we, were, we were naive. It happened in a much bigger, bigger scale than I, I'm saying now. And so you look at all of that and then just overlay climate change. Uh, climate change is an excellent, excellent example of a sector that A, has scale, it's got size, Two, China has significant IP and significant technology in the area. Africa has significant endowment in the area, not only in terms of raw material, but in terms of natural sunlight, wind, etc. And where the two combine in the kinds of 
sort of virtuous circle that I'm, I'm, I'm trying to get to. So I think this is the one thing that for me is really, really an, an optimistic uh, and, and I think exciting prospect for, for joint um, uh, China, Africa, mutually transformative yeah. initiatives. Yeah, mutually, uh, um, I love this word, mutually transformative. Um, that is a very, it's an all-inclusive topic, sure. So, which areas of manufacturing do you say fastest uh, growing on the African continent? Is that fashion, textiles, or? Well, for now, it's been smartphones. Oh, it's smartphones, <laughs> yeah, yeah, of course, yeah. Um, And today, 64% of smartphones used in the African continent come from China. Wow. And for, for Africa, that is so because we skipped completely leapfrogged the landline mm -hmm. phase. We, we had maybe four or five percent uh, penetration of landlines. We went straight in, into mobile. Mm -hmm. Number one. Number two, you have an, a disproportionate extent, uh, proportion of Africans who are unbanked. So payments and movement of money happens on a phone. Mm -hmm. Mobile banking is high, its highest penetration on planet mm -hmm. Earth is in Africa. So if you think about products and services that support that ecosystem, you will see those trials and, and actually proliferate in the African continent. Wow, interesting. Thank I'm you. reminded of the Chinese experience, uh, whereby I used to live in the United States for eight years, Washington, DC, and uh, I lost count uh, how many credit cards that I opened. Because <laughs> every day in your mailbox, there's an offer. It says, uh, opening bonus this, opening bonus that, and. Um, on, on average, I learned that uh, average American families with four or five people have on a uh, average uh, credit card uh, number of 13, 14 credit cards. Wow. But right back in China, um, I think we skipped the credit card um, phase whereby we uh, leapfrogged into mobile payment, um, whereby back in China, there's a reverse cultural shock where I have to uh, get my WeChat Pay and Alipay ready. Uh, it's, it's, it's a cashless society in China. So I'm reminded of that. Uh, but uh, in America, I heard these days, uh, the credit card is also um, phasing out, or at least mobile payment is becoming much of an option here. I'm reminded by the organizer that we have about 10, 15 minutes left. Uh, I would like to open it up for, for questions, really. If any of you have a question, please identify yourself and ask. OK, um, sorry, that gentleman and then uh, that lady, yeah. Hello, everyone. Thank you for the presentation. My name is James YGL from Ghana. Okay, so um, it is true that Africa is moving towards China, but we see that most of the concessionary loans from China is often hedged with natural resources. For instance, the Sino Hydro loan to Ghana has been hedged with diamond reserve in the forest. Civil society organizations and community people have spoken against this, organized demonstrations, and have often petitioned international organizations against the destruction of forest. Coupled with this is the issue of corruption and low quality of infrastructure. My question is, is this not likely going to lead to frictions between China and the local people at least? And the second question is, is this not new colonization in disguise? Thank you. Who would like to address the question to? Professor. <laughs> <laughs> I, I suppose to represent the one point four billion <laughs> Chinese receive. Sorry to say that. Okay, I have the duty, of course, uh, to receive. Uh, firstly, you say uh, Africa goes to China. <laughs> Africa go to the future. <laughs> China uh, work together with Africa towards the shared future. I think that's the. Year. But Zimbabwe, you mentioned, 2003, South Zimbabwe Africa, is the South pioneer. Africa. Oh, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Zimbabwe is the first uh, country, actually, in uh, Africa. 2003, uh, have the policy of the look to the east, the China. Uh, 2003, so actually, pioneer out there. That's a reason, you know, benefit a lot. OK, not, not, but look to China is want to share some experience with China. It's not getting modernization. It's not just the, be the Chinese airlines. No, never. OK, that's um, 
to the future, to so a better future. Oh, now uh, the five, the economic growth, um, uh, fast growth, they are share some experience with China, even the training in uh, Ethiopia, in uh, South Africa, they have their training. In, uh, China will have the central party school to train in the officials. That's very important. Not just politicians look and look and look and say, say back and then practice in the grassroots. So that's the uh, some stories. But the colonization. Okay, China uh, as a world factory, uh, before import a lot of the oil and resources, materials to China and then made and then sells to Europe. Uh, <laughs> To the for the world, so China polluted China uh, or the for, for, for that that kind of model change. So today we say synergies of the strategy of the Belt Road Initiative with the uh, 2063 of the African Union uh, uh, of the it's a so-called the Made in Africa with China for the world. It's not just Made in China. So that's the reason you mentioned about Ethiopia, the uh, five direct flights to China now, be the regional hub of the uh, air transportation. Really. So the hope then the African to modernize, to be the hub. It's not just the traditional model. The old model, the Washington consensus, that model finished. Back to the history, why China do this? Of course, we should learn the lessons to uh, pollute the, 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 the local, and it's good, not good. The problem is for Africa. You need this, you need that. But they want to share some experience with China, say, build the road if you want to get rich. Build the motor road if we want to reach quickly. But where else the money comes from? Usually there are two kinds of models. One is the special leasing rights. It's like a, some Africans you know, lend uh, this to China's commercial limited and then invest a lot for that because we you need to make money, the commercial uh, driven. Another, if you can have not the special leasing rights, sometimes you have the resources and then give Chinese companies to deploy and then earn the money and invest in infrastructure. So this China also did it before. We polluted, we destroyed the uh, forest. And unfortunately, so China, at the beginning, yes, did this. But now we learn from this. Now in South Africa, in, uh, uh, they, they want to learn some China's uh, so-called the North Sheta Belt Program. You know, you, what, is we, the, you may, what is that? North? Sanbei Fang Huh? Sanbei ah, Fang the, the, uh, the three North? Shelter uh, program. Shelter program. program. That because is of the desert, the environment. you know, the desert and the expansion. So how China solved this problem to let the desert be the uh, planet? So, so that kind of story is now so called the Green Great War in South Africa. Not just South Africa, all South Africa. So that kind of story is changing. Okay, ma'am. Um, I hope it's okay. I have a yeah. quick comment and then a, a question that's completely different. The comment is about uh, Europe exporting its models, which of course uh, is history too. But I am a professor, sorry, my name is Joanna Bryson, professor of ethics and technology at the Hertie School in Germany. And part of what happened was, in fact, during uh, George Bush administration, that uh, scientists were doing things that were no longer considered legal and ethical in Europe, and so they did them in other countries instead. So sometimes when we're seen as exporting our models, it is now that we are forced, if we say something is ethical, that it's ethical worldwide, that we aren't allowed to uh, undermine our own morals by moving abroad. And so I can see this sounds like enforcement because they say, oh, we have to follow these laws, but it really is trying to stop being colonial sometimes. I know there's also bad things, but sometimes it really is us trying to be better than we have been. The, qu the, the question, I, uh, this is directed to, to the chairwoman. Um, I, uh, you, you mentioned climate change, and I was excited because I'm terrified. <laughs> uh, and uh, you, you talked about the financial opportunities, but I hope that um, when you're talking about an uh, African Union really being a free trade, what about uh, free movement? Because there will be uh, climate migration too, right? So I'm wondering if uh, a lot of the numbers and, and optimism I've heard is as if nobody is going to move. Are all these city growth and all this, is this reflecting the climate change reality of the next 10 years? Good, good, good question. Uh, and as you come from Europe, you will well and truly appreciate that the free movement of people is holy grail. You know, it is the final kind of nail in the coffin. Um, and in my mind, I cannot be quoted on this because it's just what I read from the tea leaves. The reason the free trade area has made so little progress is exactly that, that people um, 
there are some governments within Africa who are absolutely terrified of uh, the free movement of people. Underlying that are some real concerns. South Africa today sits with an unemployment rate amongst the youth of over 50%. And so you start to say, well, we can't employ our own people. How can we net net be importers of others? And at the moment, South Africa actually is a, is a huge importer of other Africans coming from elsewhere. Um, and we haven't been as discriminating as, say, the US has been in you're going to get advanced skills visas easily, but not unskilled. We, we're trying to solve that. So, so I think the issue of free movement has been bedeviled by employment patterns around the continent. However, climate change will mandate it. There is no way that you're going to be able to rebuild some parts of the continent that have been plagued by extreme weather events in a continent that did not have very resilient building structures and codes. You saw this in Malawi. I mean, there are parts of Malawi are completely destroyed. How are you going to rebuild that? So, so I do think that the humanitarian side of migration will happen irrespective of free trade or anything else just because uh, climate change is making it impossible not to do so. And uh, if, you, if you look where we've seen the most severe climate impact in the recent term, they've all been, well, not all, mostly on the East Coast, uh, Mozambique being one, Madagascar very much affected, Malawi this last time absolutely clobbered, Durban to some degree. So I think that whether we like it or not, that, that's going to happen. The one that it will happen after, long after I'm dead, is the free trade of movement because of free trade. <clears throat> Great. Um, I think, uh, do we have time for one more question? Yes? All right. Please. Um, my question is uh, to Mr. Minister. And uh, for your country, uh, which sector is most needed to be invested in infrastructure, um, energy, or mining? Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Madam. <clears throat> and I'm happy to say uh, it's broad. Uh, the choice is yours. We've got the rail, we've got the roads, like I indicated, the water bodies, and even the skies. So, so we are open to business. And um, once again, to those who are seated here and beyond, to say uh, we've got a mantra that we are running with, that Zimbabwe is open for business. So there are vast opportunities that you can tap into. So feel free, I'm, I'm the Minister of Infrastructure, we can engage. And if you've got a particular sector that you want, we can start working on it right now. Thank you. <laughs> Get this WeChat after the session. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so uh, finally, I want to take this opportunity to really thank all our panelists for traveling all the way uh, to Tianjin, China. Um, I hope that you have had a great time, as uh, I have had. It's been a great World Economic Forum session. Uh, thank you for this very lively discussion and debate. I think uh, it's fair to say that we all walk away better informed um, uh, about the nuance of this relationship and about Africa. Um, we don't necessarily all the time see eye to eye with each other on all the issues. Um, but I think uh, in China we say that uh, with more debate, uh, the truth becomes clearer. And I hope this session achieves just that. Um, thank you all once again, and thank our audience for being here, and our viewers watching this live streaming. Thank you very much.